Here we go. Um, tell me why why do you want to serve on the Ohio Supreme Court? Because I have been given the opportunity through my experiences to bring to the court a complete judge, somebody who's tried cases, who has uh, done appeals, who's traveled all over the country, not just all over the state trying cases, all over the country, plus how many people have actually had cases they've succeeded in winning in the circuit, federal circuit courts and in the U.S. Supreme Court. I bring a plethora, and plus, having been state bar president, part of the job of the Ohio Supreme Court is to appoint people to these committees and commissions that write the rules. Mm -hmm. I have, I've had to do that. As, so I've, I've had to see it from all over, and including uh, anything from rules changes to, uh, to appeals to unusual writs and even death penalty cases. So uh, I bring the complete package and my ability to hand those four, what I call the four eyes, independence, impartiality, intelligence, and integrity. I bring all four to the table, and I think the people of Ohio, uh, I hope, would benefit from my experiences and abilities. What, what would you bring to the court that's not already there? I bring, for one thing, 27 years of private practice. A lot of them have maybe a year or two. I think Judge DeWine, who's running, has 10 to 12, something like that, 13. I'm the kind of guy who had to practice all over the country, like I said, or all over the state. I had a case one time where there were 2.5 million documents. It cost a million, 1.1 million to have them looked at and produced. The other side used 11. So 1.1 million over 11 pages is $100,000 a page. No one else on the court has had to deal with things like that. No one else has had to deal with pro bono cases involving rape victims. No one else has brought to the court the, the uh, concept of having tried a case for 16 weeks to jury verdict or had to use a peremptory challenge in L.A. to knock off a, a, a potential juror who, who was 80-some years old, had come from Laos, and had only spoke Hmong. And I, my, I bring a plethora of experiences no one has had, and for that matter, uh, an area of law, I, I doubt uh, anybody else had to take oil and gas law, and I'm licensed also in Texas, and all, the whole eastern part of the state <laughs> would like someone with at least some understanding of that area of the law. Uh, so I think I, I, I think I do bring something different, very different, because, you know, on discovery disputes, even those that were prosecutors, most of those discovery disputes are very minimal and decided by the U.S. Supreme Court long beforehand. Mm -hmm. I deal, I've had to deal with civil, also with civil disputes that very few of the justices, that, I don't know, maybe Justice French, maybe, when mm -hmm. she was practicing, but she didn't practice in private that much either. Uh, but anyway, no, I, I bring a unique perspective. <laughs> You ran as a Republican in the primary. Yeah. The general election obviously is nonpartisan. Should party labels be included in judicial races on the ballot in primaries and or general elections? I, uh, I, I don't know if we're allowed to take a position on that. Uh, if the others have the others, yeah. Okay. Well, then I guess that's the election of judges, judicial administration. I guess we can. No, I don't think so. I think once you put on the robe. And, for example, I'm supported not just by the Ohio Republican Party, I'm supported by the Black Women's Political Action Committee. I have a group in Cincinnati called Democrats for Pat. I, I got broad support, and that's a nonpartisan election permits people to kind of cross over and, and pick judges based upon their abilities and not a, based upon partisan label, and for that matter, almost like one percent of the cases or less deal with what you would what people would consider political issues so 99 percent of it's nonpartisan anyway so that's why it should be nonpartisan I but how does you, you ran as a republican how does that affect how you approach the bench it must have some effect on how you approach the bench in your well i'm a i'm a republican because uh jimmy carter <laughs> so his foreign policy was just terrible uh, that was years ago when I was young, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think 
the only I think there is a some difference partisan wise, but I think the Republicans believe in more of a strict construction viewpoint, and the Democrats, especially at the federal level and the federal Supreme Court level, have been appointing people who believe in you know a movable constitution, uh, changeable based upon the feelings of the judge. And I, I, di I do disagree with that. I, I think you need to take the Constitution, the statutes, or a contract on its word and apply it to the facts found by the jury. Uh, I think if you, otherwise it's just, it's luck of the draw, it's whatever judge you get. You should be able to get two or three, four different judges and get basically the same result. And that's the goal. Kind of along those lines, can you, in in a way that would an average person would understand without legalese, kind of explain your judicial philosophy? I mean, okay. you hear a lot about judicial activism, making laws from the bench, right. whatever. What's your What's your approach to that in layman's terms? Okay, not legislating from the bench does this in layman's terms. I have a contract. Let's say I'm adjudicating, or a statute. Mm -hmm. I go to the point, if you remember from grade school, where you diagram the sentence, find out what that sentence means, and apply it to the facts found by the jury. That's it. Don't add my personal interest. Don't add, I, I, every two, not every day, but every two, three months, I enforce a law that I think the wisdom of the legislature wasn't that wise. And, but I'll enforce it just as written because courts don't have the capabilities of the legislature to take testimony on grand issues and big issues. We, we're just trying to resolve a dispute. Now, a byproduct of that is the creation of case law. But the parties don't care about the big issue. They just care about whether they win or lose. So courts aren't equipped to deal with all that, and therefore let the legislature do it, and then just take that, that statute, or if it's two parties, their contract, Look at the sentence that's applicable, or the two sentences. Apply it to the facts. Very simple. Applying the law instead of creating it is the way I would look at it. Is that yeah, yeah. basic enough? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That makes sense. Um, I know judges obviously are limited in what you can say about specific issues, although sure. there is one member of the Supreme Court, Ohio Supreme Court, who's a little more free in expressing his opinions on those things. I'm asking all the all the candidates about the death penalty. How do okay. you how do you approach the death penalty? Well, death, whether I like it or not, the death penalty is the law of the state of Ohio. Thus, it has to be enforced. Now, with that said, I grew up taught, and my whole, my older four older siblings went to Jesuit colleges, and all the five boys we went to Jesuit high school. Jesuits are strongly anti-death penalty, which fits with their religious background. And a guy named Father Bob O'Connor was kind of like the family priest. He was at like at my mom's funeral and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And he and I would have big discussions. This was before I became a judge about the death penalty. And he almost had me talked into thinking it was morally wrong. But I happened to have a business trip to Oklahoma City. And the plane was delayed, so I went to the memorial where the Murrah building was knocked down by uh, Timothy McVeigh. And you go through a museum and you come out in this park. Have you ever been there? Okay. You come out in this park and there's these chairs that are much bigger than the chair I'm sitting in. that are acrylic or something because you can see through them, but they got the names of the, of the deceased adults. But then they got little ones, uh, kindergarten size for the little kids. And there's a woman on her knees, on the ground, with her head down on one of the little kid chairs not just crying, I'm talking bawling. There's six, ten people around her, one of them holding a the cake. I presume it was the little kid's birthday. And I thought to myself, I didn't hear anybody complain when they executed Timothy McVeigh. And thus, there is a time for the death penalty. We executed Tojo. If we would have caught Hitler, we would have executed him that once you cross, and Father O'Connor would have agreed with this, once you cross the Rubicon that you can execute one person, then the moral argument doesn't follow. Uh, you're either totally for it or totally against it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was proper to execute Timothy McVeigh. And after seeing that woman, I, 
felt more so. And uh, so I don't know how to, I, is that you're answering a question? I, 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 whether I believe that or not, though, is totally irrelevant. You have to enforce the law. The law of the state of Ohio is that, the, uh, that uh, capital punishment is permitted under certain circumstances. And therefore, I will enforce the law whether I disagree with it. On this case, I agree with it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I do not, dis I have some questions with those people that say, you know, it takes too long. I understand the argument because I am a big person about justice delayed is justice denied. But in this, in the instance of capital punishment, I don't think justice delayed is necessarily justice denied because you can't make a mistake in these cases for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I'm okay with it and, and I'll enforce it. And I, whether I was okay with it or not, I would enforce it. Just like I said, I enforce other laws that I think are stupid. That one I don't think so stupid, but uh, there are laws that I think are stupid. Well, what laws. do you do as a judge? Okay, so you have a law, you think it's stupid. I understand you're deciding something from the bench. Do you have a role to tell the public, hey, this law is stupid? You do, and I have done that. I had a case involving school bus, and it's a long story, too uh -huh. long for this interview, but uh, I wrote a concurrence saying I agree with the majority, but because we're enforcing the law as written. But legislature, do something about this. I didn't tell them what to do. Uh -huh. I don't think that's my job. But my job is to notify the legislature or the public there is a problem here the way, because they, they cut off a law and kind of left half of it hanging so no one, nobody knew what to do under some, uh, other circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, my understanding is they did change it or they did something to add to it. But yes, that is my duty, but again, my duty is not to write that law. My duty to enforce it as written, but I also have uh, a position, ability to tell people, "Hey, you got to do something about this." But then it's up to them. You've been over your qualifications. Without turning this into some kind of attack against your opponent, why are you the better choice than the person you're running against in this race? I have. Far more, as I've gone over it, far more experience, not just through Ohio. I've had cases in Cincinnati. I've had cases in Cleveland. I've been all over the state. I've been uh, all over the country. I, I told you I was in L.A. I had a case, De uh, Dallas trial, uh, Second Circuit in New York, Tenth Circuit in Denver, and of course the Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati, and, and took a case that was filed on the Thursday before the 04 election and took it to the U.S. Supreme Court and won at 5.27 a.m. election morning. Very few lawyers have that ability. Uh, I also have that my experience as an appellate judge, which is very helpful to a Supreme Court justice, because you've got to understand the appellate issues. Uh, my opponent, no, no appellate practice, no, no, I mean, no appellate uh, experience. I've actually sat on the Ohio Supreme Court. I've sat on not just the first district where I'm at, but also the second, fourth, Seventh, eighth, twelfth, maybe some others, but those are the ones I can remember right now. I have experience all over the state in appellate practice, also. Uh, plus, I know it sounds different, but the fact I can say I've been to all 88 counties in this campaign, I've driven over 100,000 miles through the state. I understand the people of the state. My opponent just doesn't seem to be doing that. And I think getting to know people, even people in small counties, very important. You can't, you don't really represent them because mm -hmm. your duty is to the Constitution. But I think it's good to know them and know, know, know how, how they feel about, about the state and the nation. And, and by the way, so far, every newspaper has endorsed me. That's that's done endorsements. Uh, now I know you, Toledo. I don't think's done endorsement. Uh, has been, have you met with the vindicator yet? The board been board I there. I did meet with them. They haven't issued yet. Okay. Akron, for example, issued today's Monday, Sunday, yesterday morning, endorsed. So, uh, 
Obviously, there are others. And like I said, the broad range from the Ohio Republican Party on the right to the Black Women's PAC on the left, uh, a lot of people in the middle. I think people see me as a fair and impartial judge, no matter their politics. And that's the kind of people you should have on the Supreme Court. Uh, a lot of people are totally focused on a presidential race. They will pay no attention to your race, and they will not even vote in the Supreme Court race. 33% undervote. What do you say to those people? I say that your vote for the Supreme Court counts more than your vote for president because people don't vote down. So I urge you to vote for the Supreme Court. I hope you vote Fisher with a C, but uh, that uh, your vote actually, on a relative scale, has more value down ballot than it does. How so? How so? How so? What well, do you think mean? about it. Think about it. I, and I don't know if I get the math right, but the concept is right. If 33% if of the people don't vote down for the Supreme Court, every time you vote down there, it's got to be worth at least 1.33 in value. Mm -hmm. So that if, if I can get three people to go down ballot and vote, I'm actually getting four votes because one person on the other side wouldn't have voted. Yeah. And so it, I, I know it sounds weird, but it, it, it's, and I forget the exact numbers, but it, the concept is absolutely true. Your 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 voting down the ballot has more has more relative value than at the top. And and if you care about all branches of the government, you know the ABA calls the calls us the least understood branch mm -hmm. because people don't know as much as what goes on that uh, if you care about that part of the government one third of the whole power of the government I would hope that you would care enough to take an extra minute or two and vote down the ballot. Any idea why people don't? I think they don't know the uh, I think they feel that they don't know who the judges are and therefore don't want to affect an election on something that they know very little about. That's my guess. I, I, I'm sure there have been surveys or opinion polls on why people don't vote. There, there's got to be research out there. Do you run into a lot of people? I mean, you've been to all 88 counties. You yeah. run into a lot of people who don't even know that there's Supreme Court justices on the ballot? Yes. I mean, some people, because there's confusion with the federal court yeah. system, 